regarded as the fifth greatest jazz pianist of all time and a delight to his global audience that's drawn to his vibrant personality and his soulful message. Morning Coffee Guest is delighted to chat with Monty Alexander CD. More when we come back. Welcome back. I'm your host, Simone Absalom Gale. Grammy nominated pianist with more than seven decades of music, Monty Alexander has been delighting his audiences with his blend of jazz and reggae. Welcome, Monty, to the program. Yes, yes. What was life like growing up in Jamaica? I know you're from Kingston. It was really a, 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 a beautiful way to grow up. School friends playing cricket in the backyard, um, going to the Saturday morning pictures to go see the cowboy pictures, and just loving the life. And it was a paradise for a young fella growing up at that time. And I had a lot of great friends and this music came into my being. And as a result of that, here I am today, many years later, have had an adventure that is irreplaceable. But where in Kingston did you live when you were in Jamaica? Mountain View area, at the top of Mountain View, which I understand is not the sweet residential area. <laughs> but it's like a little different now. But let's face it, time marches on. And in those days, uh, they had a sound system dance at the bottom of the, the, the street, was Tucker Avenue. And in fact, not far from our house, my parents, was where Alexander Bustamante resided, the, the original way back when Chief Minister of Jamaica. And um, it was a memorable time, that's all I can say. And I was there for the first 17 years of my life until when one day my mother said, we're going to America. And I said, that's fine with me, because I saw America in the movie, on the movie screen and all the things that I wanted to be able to enjoy you know, being in New York and the whole adventure of what a musician can experience, you know, coming from a simple background. But then if your music is good and your thing is good, you can grow into... Which school did you attend? Which well, the first school in you? Kingston was a school originally called Campion Hall, and it was at Matilda's Corner by L Ligony, right? Mm -hmm. Then my people, I said, we're going to want you, we want you to have a better education and less chance to fall into foolishness, you know, and we went to Mandeville to De Carter at school, which incidentally about a month and a half ago, I happened to be in Mandeville and I went to see De Carter at, which was a good school, you know, that had the British system and I, I didn't love that, but, you know, if you did something wrong, you get what them call the cane in, them cane you because, you know, and then I ended up at JC called Jamaica College. But my mind wasn't on schoolwork. My mind was on this music thing and being with friends. And I was around my elders, the, the guys who welcomed me into their community, the guys who sit down in the bar and drink the white rum and smoke them cigarette and talk about the life and the music. And that's where I learned what I learned. I never went to music school. I'm not a music, I don't read music. All right, so you, you speak about, you know, your adventures and getting into music, but when did you discover your love for the piano? When did it start bubbling up? The piano was in the house. My mother, who would sing in the church choir, she had a penchant for wanting to play the little piano. So she bought an old, what they call upright piano and had it in our living room. And it was like a lot of people of reasonable means in those days had a piano in the house. It's like today when buy, people buy the flat screen television, they got to have the flat screen TV. No, those days there was a piano. A lot of homes had it. What about rich people having a piano? It was just a lot of people. So the piano was sitting there, I tell people, just minding its own business. My mother would plunk, plunk a little melody and I saw that and I just gravitated toward this piano like it was a toy. Because a little kid can go up and you can go bang, 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 and you get 
you, ha- you get happy doing that. I did. I did. And next thing you know, I'm playing little melodies, little songs. Mary had a little lamb, little, you know, could do that. Little by little, I'm getting more adept at this. And I notice when I'm playing, I'm having more enjoyment. And the friends and the family people that would come to the house sitting around enjoying me playing the piano. So the, the passion was lit back then, but it grew and it grew and it grew. And every now and then I would book up a roadblock, a mental roadblock. And, and then I would literally pray, P-R-A-Y, pray for inspiration. Inspiration means inviting the spirit within, even at a young age. And I say, I want to find out, I want to get deeper into this thing so that the passion will grow. And that's what happened. And to this day, I have it as like a bonfire of inspiration to make music and share the joy of that gift. And I still have it. And by the way, you get it if you seek it. If you don't seek it, it'll be over there. But you can see every human being can seek it and can find it. And if you find it, then go on, use the thing, man. Go on with it and, and enjoy life. So that's been my story. And it's all coming from, from, from heaven for me. Okay, it's said that the performance of Louis Armstrong and Nat King Cole at the Carib Theatre in the 1950s left a strong impression on you. Tell us about that experience. Well, as a kid at home, besides having the piano there, my parents would buy, as we were talking before the interview, the vinyls, right? And there was a vinyl record, and on the cover was this man in a tuxedo, African-American gentleman, by the name of Louis Armstrong, Satchmo, they call him. And he had that gravelly voice. He talked like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and I saw the picture of Louis Armstrong on the cover with a big smile. He had the trumpet in his hand. And it was a such an inviting uh, person to look at. And then you play the record and you hear this swinging New Orleans grooving music. And it just sucked, soaked me up so that Louis Armstrong became a hero of mine. And when he came to Carib, I was at school in Mandeville, and in those days, if you in, in in these days, if a child had teeth that were kind of protruding a little bit, your parents said, "Well, we have to send you to the dentist and they put the braces on the teeth." And that's what I had. So I had the braces on my teeth, and it was obviously fixing the teeth because these days they're not sticking out like when I was a kid. But the wire in the in the in the braces. If the wire came out, one of the wires, it would protrude, protrude into my jaw like this, right? <laughs> so I come up, I come up with a piece that we call ginery, right? I went to the headmaster of the school and said, "Sir, this thing is in my mouth, and I have to go to the dentist." And said, "What is?" It? I said, "Yeah, I have to go to the dentist." And the, the whole idea was that my father would pick me up at the school gate two hours before such more performed at character Tom. And we went to the dentist. He wrote the little letter because he knew I was being a trickster. And he, he said, he said, the dentist wrote the letter. Monty Alexander was here. You know, I just put back the, the wire, no problem. And I went to the carib. My father was with me. It was a bit of the mischief too, my dad. My mother was like, don't do them things, right? And we went to carib. I saw this man light up that theater. And at the end of it, my father knew the promoter of the show. I went backstage and I shook Satchmo's hand and I didn't wash my hand for about two months. <laughs> <laughs> and my other hero, because we heard the records in the house, was Nat King Cole. And I you love know, Nat King Cole. Well, I'm honored to tell you, well, first of all, I snuck out of school again. I saw the concert. I was blown over and I just dreamed, oh, wow, I wish I could meet that man. Because everything about him was the essence and the epitome of grace, gracefulness. He was so, you hear it in his voice. And, and then 40 years later, guess what? His daughter, Natalie, she contacted me personally, her manager, to come and play on her record, the one, the famous record she made called Unforgettable. And I'm yes. playing the piano on that record. And Matt, Natalie sends me a platinum disc of the uh, of that of the recording. So all the way from Nat King Cole at 10 years old, when I saw him and all the records, the vinyls that my parents had, those songs, unforgettable, them kind of songs. And love, my favorite one is love. L L is for the way you look look. at me. Right, that's right, another one of mine. But this record I've done is just coming out in a couple of weeks. 
It's called Love Notes. And the inspiration is Nat King Cole and Harry Belafonte. But it's Rocker's Rhythm. The whole way through it, you have Rocker's Rhythm, Jamaica, Jamaica. And I'm so proud that I did it because I've made over 75 albums as a piano player. Piano, 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 piano. Have it, have a board. But I did never, I never did a singing record. So this is me singing. And this is it. And and I'm happy it came out. People love it. Want to sing it. And, um, and I tell you, I'm, my time, it's the 60th anniversary of a blessed, beloved Jamaica. And I'm just so happy it's happening. And over this period of time, all these events are taking place. You are there to big it up in a beautiful way. All right. So you've spoken about Armstrong and Nat King Cole. Who are some of your other influences and why? Well, I loved all music. All music, especially music with a rhythm. You know, if the, if the rhythm is in the music, I start dancing. You know, I loved it, loved it from the beginning. And somehow it, it, it uh, captured me to the point that when I would evidence that, people would start grooving, just me at the piano, you know? And I love American rhythm and blues. I could pick up the radio, on the radio, New Orleans stations, where Fats Domino, Little Richard, all these people, including Elvis Presley, all these people that were popular on the radio, I heard that music, right? So when these artists also came to the Carib Theater, because this is the 50s now we're talking, it included Jackie Wilson, Brooke Benton, Sam Cooke, these are names I hope the world would never forget because these guys were making the hit records back in the mid fifties and it was a real man blues and people start dancing and they're hearing Benny King talk about, you know, I saw the platters, I saw the drifters. These were the forerunners to the temptations and all cross section of American, black American music. That was for me, the real soul of this music. And I love that no less or more than I love mental. I was, going around to the mentor of bands in Jamaica, sitting in with my accordion and playing along with those older guys who were singing all the, the Caribbean, the Golden State Market, all these songs. I knew them, but I knew the rhythm and blues music that I heard and saw. And then uh, this, these great men of what they call jazz included Louis Armstrong, Nat Cole. So my music is a whole gang load of all kinds of music, but music that moves you. Music, not no sit on the one old people, no, 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 we want the spirit in the music, which you hear in the gospel music in the church. My, one of my favorite artists was Mahalia Jackson, who sang gospel in Chicago in the Baptist church. And when she starts singing those songs, and by the way, that's the forerunner to Aretha Franklin, the forerunner to Whitney Houston, the forerunner to all these people. So I heard the history and you talked about Herbie Miller. So when Herbie Miller is talking about the music, he and I are sharing this awareness, not just what we have today, but an important thing, where it came from. By the way, it came from Africa, <laughs> no doubt about it. The European addition was like the sweetening to some of it, but the roots is an African, West African experience. And that's what Jamaica brings more raw than anywhere else. In the early years, what was the industry like and how did you distinguish yourself from other artists? I didn't think about any distinguishing. I just, just go on about my business, one foot in front of the other. I would go and, and say, man, here come man. And I was full of this passion to play. And I just think about playing and enjoying the appreciation of these other men that were 10 years older than I, because I I want I respected my elders. I wasn't so much a fan of being around my age group. I didn't I, I didn't feel like th that's where I could enjoy myself. I want to be around these guys and feel like I was accepted by them. So I never had time to be thinking about how distinguished or any of that. I was I would I like to be accepted. Somebody said I heard you play a mountain. I didn't like how you played. That would hurt my feelings. Needless to say, but I didn't think about it. I just think about. It. And I have a saying, I thought about the donut, not the hole. Okay, okay. The donut is the positivity. Even at a young age, I was looking for the donut. And when I would play, I would reflect positivity, not doubt or fear or apprehension or negative. No, man, me gone right for the juggler of joy. The juggler of joy. I just made that word up. You, you migrated, you know, you're going through life. I'm trying to imagine the young Monty. How did you you know, make your way up? Did you play in, 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 in 
did, did the usual way where you'd play in soul bars and stuff like that? Or did you go to school and you knew people? No school, no school. One more time, no school. And I went to a school. My mother said, "But well, you, you're doing this piano thing, and you should go to the piano teacher, like a lot of kids would do." And I remember went to this piano teacher, a lady who was very accomplished and very learned and very uh, excellent with that lady. And I remember go sitting there, and she's telling me this, that, the other. But by before that, I'm already playing the piano by myself, having fun, F-U-N, fun. Playing my boogie woogie rhythm, playing my calypso music, this, that, you know. So by the time I get to the piano lessons and she take the ruler and lick me from my knuckles, hit me, you know. It didn't hurt a lot, but I'm saying, I, I don't want this anymore. I don't like, I don't like, I already love music. I don't want this person to ruin it for me. I kind of did. And I gravitated away from taking piano lessons. And from that day, I never took a piano lesson with anybody. Everything came to me from heaven. I literally mean it. The people say, come on, man, that ain't true. That's not true. It's, it is true. And um, my adventure came from sucking up and soaking up the good vibes. So what you do when you were in, in America, though? How did you get involved in the music scene in I, that I, country? I'm going to tell you. I was in Miami, Florida, Miami Beach. And I was just the wayward kid, two in the morning when my mother said, where you gone? I gone out on the street corner, minding my own business, being careful to avoid um, harmful situations. And I would hear music coming from a bar or a club and I'd peer, peek my head in the door and I made friends with the local musicians. Now I'm just 18 years, 17, 18. Just about the time of Jamaica's independence, right? And I would go into the bar and little by little, I start to what we call sit in with the guys that are playing. And I would play and I'm joining them playing blues, playing some rhythm, playing some whatever. And I'm right in there with them. Something was already there. And little by little, I'm just becoming my, my routine, right? This is just over a period of a few months. And one night I'm playing in one of these places. It was a kind of strip joint, what I call the pin-up lounge. The girls were very scantily attired, you know, strip thing. And I'm playing, and a, a little elderly gentleman sitting at the bar sees me playing, and he come, American gentleman, say, hey, kid, I, I like how you're playing those keys on the piano. I like it. You know, you where are you from? I said, Jamaica. I said, huh, huh. You know, I can, I'm an agent. I could get you work. I said, really? And I went back to my mother. I said, mommy, a man come to me last night and say, um, him can get me a work to go play the piano here, there, everywhere. I said, and she said, she looked at me very suspicious because she's not thinking that we from Jamaica are going to conquer the scene in America in any kind of way. She, she's not thinking that I could be that accepted. But guess what? I was. And I started getting little, we say in America, gigs, little jobs to play here, to play there, to play here. And these were places, bars, saloons, nightclubs, joints, and the people that come in, they come in there to drink them liquor. And they would have the piano music, and I would have a little combo, and I played in a lot of these places, one, two, three, four of these places, in Miami. Because Miami was a hot place with entertainment. And one night I'm playing in one of these clubs, and Frank Sinatra walks in the club. He and his friends saw me playing. This is the magic in my story. It, people write, tell me to write the book. I gotta write the book. And I'm playing the piano, just going up there as usual, going on the piano, piano, and the people going, yeah, kids, swinging, swinging. And somebody comes to me and say, where you learn to do that? And I kind of, I didn't know what to answer. It's like I'm answering your questions now. So I'm just bumbling. And finally, the, this lady, she said, I want to take you to this table to meet somebody. And she walked me over to the table where Frank Sinatra was sitting. This king of show business, they call it, the number one star of everything. And I walk over and I see this, this man I've seen on the magazine covers, of his music, and his friend who had a nightclub in New York, a named Jilly, Jilly. And Jilly and Sinatra look at me, you should be in New York. New York, the capital for the music and everything. And one thing led to another. They sent me an airline ticket. I went to New York. It was the summer of 1963. I had just turned 19. And there I am playing in the hottest joint in New York City for entertainment, for jazz. It's only a small club called Jilly's. 
Sinatra would come there whenever he came to New York. He'd come there to hang out with his friends. And lo and behold, I am there in this incredible, uh, unbelievable situation. And you can only say that is God moving in your life because it was a gift. I, I didn't plan it. I didn't try to do it. I didn't try to go to school, but it came to me. And I was there playing at this place, swinging the music. And the, the, but the place is being occupied by sometimes gangsters, these guys that carry a gun, right? I'm there in that place. Or the, what we used to call the hookers, the prostitutes, they're there. The pimps are there. These are the kinds of people I'm playing for. I'm not playing for no music aficionado. I'm playing for this, the real life of New York City where people of ill repute and of question, they're in the place. And, you know, we used to say they're white, wise guys, meaning they know everything. You ever see them movies like, um, you know, The Godfather? Our face. Exactly. Exactly. Al Pacino and Robert De Niro, these kind of movies, right? And it was very much like that, you know? So weren't you scared? I mean, you're Jamaican. I'm, I'm betting you're, you're thinking, oh, I'm not even getting involved. You know, guess what? I was having a party. The, the time of my life, and I remember knowing that one of the things I have to do is not fall into the behaviors that some of these people had, which included a lot of alcohol and the emergence of cocaine at that time. And I had the good Jamaican upbringing here, the, the preacher in the church, and here my mother say, I go and box you across your face if I ever hear you smoking the, the weed. The weed are the, the devil. Of course, it's, a, it's not that, so these, we don't look at it like that. And um, it was really a time of um, question that what would happen to me, but I had the wisdom or the blessing to stay away from these things that destroy your life. And I was really blessed. And I kept playing the piano and music and getting, you know, inspiration. And that was in, and from 1965 to now, I have made 75 albums, Monte Alexander performances. And in the last 20 years or so, I re-embraced my Jamaican roots. So I made albums with Sly and Robbie. I had music I did, you remember Luciano? I did records with Dean Frazier. I did music. I did two albums of Bob Marley's music. So I re befriended because a different group of young Jamaicans now. You know, my time was back in the sixties. So it's just been a really great journey. All right, we take a short break and come right back with more from Monty Alexander. Welcome back to Morning Coffee Guests. We're talking to jazz pianist extraordinaire, Monty Alexander. Monty, thanks for staying with us. Now, you have collaborated with so many singers and musicians over the years. Which ones were the more favorite, or should I say, which ones are more memorable to you? Memorable from the different reasons for memorable. Memorable can be because a man who might be so established in the entertainment business. For example, I did a movie with Clint Eastwood, the great actor. Clint Eastwood made a movie about this great jazz saxophone player named Charlie Parker. He was the bebop king. This, when, if you ask Herbie Miller about Charlie Parker, he'll tell you all great stuff. And it was called Bird. And I played music in that movie for Clint Eastwood, who made, made that film. Then the thing with Natalie, because she was such a beautiful lady, you know, in, in so many ways, and recordings I've done with the great singer Tony Bennett. I've done recordings. These were all fab. But the best time I ever had was when I made my own records for myself, do my own thing. When I was merging with other people, I had to bend and compromise. But when I was free as a bird, I would just do what I do, you know? You are the 2022 Jamaica Poetry Festival honoree. How do you feel about that honor? Well, first of all, anything coming out of Jamaica that is honoring one special event, a cultural thing that is of much importance that will help young people embrace how to artistically express themselves. You see, when you start doing that, that's one more step away from idleness and foolishness. When you have, look at me, 
piano playing came into my life and it has helped to keep me out of trouble. So how do I feel about it? When I heard, I was so delighted because whether it's dub poetry or whether it's music or whether it's dance company, because National Dance Theatre Jamaica used some of my music. And I mean, Honorable Rex Nettleford took some of my music. So I was always honored, you know? And when I was approached for that, I, I received this marvelous invitation and I was really honored and delighted to receive it. What about some of your future projects? I mean, what do you plan to do? What's next? I know you have your album out, so, but what's next after that? And this is the first time I did a vocal album singing. And um, it's like I said, love songs. The album is called Love Notes. It's like when you're writing a letter to your loved person, right? It's a note. So you're writing, and these songs, some of them that Nat King Cole recorded, and Natalie recorded, but I put them in what Herbie Miller might say is a rocker's groove with Jamaican musicians. And I did it, and uh, the photos were taken up on the north coast by the seaside. And you have a cross section of my vocal interpretations. And I'm happy to say, even though it comes out on August the 19th, that it has been received so marvelously. We released a couple of tracks. And there, right now there is a, a, a nice video of me singing um, as time goes by, a classic song. And my friend Courtney Panton is a director. He did the video work on it. That's sensational. People, people say, man, this is wonderful, first class stuff. So Mr. Panton really made it happen. I'm happy to say I keep receiving invitations to play all over the world. For example, coming in a few weeks, I have a booking in Mumbai, India. India. I'd never been to India. Um, I'm going to be playing in Europe again in October, September rather. October, I have gigs all over America. So I'm not stopping. And even though I'm a young fellow of 23 years old, young, <laughs> I'm going to be going when they offer me the job, you know? And sometimes payment may not be like get rich quick. No, it's the joy of sharing the music. Keep expressing yourself. And that in itself is the greatest therapy medicine you could ever want to take and just to express your music and give joy to people which most of the time is what happens when people hear me play like i bring joy all right in the spirit of celebrating jamaica 60 you know jamaica's 60th year of independence i've been doing this new game it's called song or word association so i'll give you a word and you give me a song or just like a line a lyric or the chorus of the song. All right, ready? Jamaica. I'll tell you a quick something. I <laughs> lived on Tucker Avenue in Mountain View and nearby was the home of what, who was referred to as Sir Alexander Bustamante. This mm -hmm. was one of our great heroes, right? Mm -hmm. And I heard a piano being played. Mm -hmm. And I, I went to the gate. My mother knew who was then Miss Longbridge, who became Lady Buster Martin. She knocked on the gate and he, she, my mother knew Gladys. Mm -hmm. And my mother's name was May. And Gladys come to the gate, say, hello, May. And she says, Gladys, my little, my little boy, Monty, hear the man playing the piano. Can he come and watch the man playing the piano? And she let me in and we went to the living room and there was Buster, you know, with the, the here. And there was the man playing the piano. It was Sir Robert, Honorable Robert Lightburn. And Robert Lightburn is the composer of Jamaica, Land We Love. He wrote that song along with the revered Philip Sherlock. He wrote the words. So Sherlock wrote, it was like a prayer. Lightburn wrote the music. And I remember meeting Robert Lightburn and him give me the little cougar and say, kid, you're doing great. And, and I was so inspired when I saw him because he was a fine pianist. Mr. Lightburn was. So All right. that's a personal story. Thank you so much. We have barely scratched the surface of one of Jamaica's icons, but we have to leave it there today. We've been talking with jazz pianist Monty Alexander. Thanks so much for watching. Until next time, walk good.